Hello, everybody. Welcome along. Um, thank you for letting me know where you are in the comment section. That's always a really good thing. Um, it's really nice to see you and uh, know that you're there and uh, find out where you're watching from. So please keep all those comments coming and then I can say hello to you, whether you're very far away in India um, or whether you're just around the corner. It's really, really good to know. So welcome, everybody. Um, especially welcome if you're watching live. Um, welcome if you're not watching live, but you've watched the rest of the series. And also welcome if it's the first one of these that you've watched. Um, they are all available online after I've broadcast them, um, but generally I'm broadcasting at two o'clock every other day. Um, and I think this is about number 10 or 11 that we've done so far. So I hope you're enjoying everything um, that I'm producing. And also, if there's stuff that you want to know, please keep all those suggestions coming um, because it's really useful for me to know what you'd like me to discuss or what you'd like me to explain um, if you want things um, demystifying. So the general way this goes is that um, I talk a little bit, I do a little bit of a recap and then um, we explore a big theme. And then within that, there are some other themes that we look at and it might be how to go about creating artwork. Um, it might be something technical. Um, or it might be about trying to problem solve something that you've had difficulties with. Because art is hard, drawing is hard, painting is hard. Every drawing you do is difficult. Um, every painting that you do is difficult. So um, yeah, don't, uh, don't expect it to be easy. It's never easy. I think um, it just gets a little bit um, uh, less stressful, uh, more enjoyable. You um, end up um, accepting your limits, your mistakes and your failings and sometimes embracing them, which I hope that we're all getting better at. Right, um, there's somebody watching in Miami and Singapore and Northumberland. Northumberland. Um, that is really fantastic to know. Hello, Rick, hello, Patrick, hello, Claire. Right, so um, the rainbows uh, we did last time. So I hope you enjoyed uh, looking at some new techniques, which of course you can apply to, uh, to, to other stuff as well. So um, I had a lovely image today of some flowers which were done where um, the colors were bleeding into one another and that seemed quite experimental and kind of was about freeing ourselves up and not being so tight when we uh, draw something very intricate, which is also going to be today's theme actually. Um, so I'm looking forward to sharing with you guys uh, a little bit of that. Um, the last landscape um, tutorial was about simplification. So this is going to be very different. That one was about looking at a complicated landscape and trying to simplify it um, as a way of starting and breaking things down. Um, and there's somebody from Turin and somebody uh, who is getting painter's block. I guess that's like writer's block. So we can all discuss all those kind of things. So please keep those comments coming. Okay, so today, landscape two is about, well, it's about looking into landscape and looking for things in landscape. And landscape is tied for me with uh, nature. So today is going to be looking at drawing and painting um, something very specific. But the main topic is about trying to take something really ugly and make something really beautiful. Because I think that's a really good way of looking at art um, in general, whether you're creating a building, a dress, a piece of furniture, a painting or a drawing, taking something that you've noticed that's overlooked and trying to do something really, really amazing with it. So today's theme is about taking something ugly, which is going to be weeds, and trying to make them really beautiful. Try and do, I'm going to show you a couple of ways of doing something uh, to try and make really beautiful paintings of something. So look, I hate flowers. There, I've said it, right? I just don't like flowers. I love plants, but I don't like flowers. I find them sentimental. I find them pretty. And um, I, yeah, I just, I just don't really like them. I don't like growing them. I don't like receiving them. I don't like giving them um, to people. Um, but I really, really love plants. I'm fascinated by nature, about how it grows. You've already heard me talk about the color green and how fascinating I find that. So today we're gonna to be looking at plants, but I figured that if you don't have a garden, um, uh, but you are outside, the one thing that you can do is go and find some really, really spectacularly ugly weeds and pick them. So I'm not advocating picking flowers, don't do that. But what I would like you to do is go and uh, find on your walk the most horrible weeds you possibly can. So I've got some specimens here and um, look at this one. 
Okay. Right. So I found that yesterday when I was uh, thinking about this, and uh, it's just it's just horrific. It looks like a um, it's early in the season, right? But it's already grown a lot, and it's about to do something really horrible. And uh, it was kind of just lying there like a massive spider on the pavement. So find a really, really horrible weed. That's the starting point. So like I was saying, I think art and floristry, uh, sorry, flowers and floristry is already art in itself. So if we're going to do a painting of something really beautiful, um, I think there's not much tension there. But for me, there's loads of tension if you take something really traditionally horrible like a weed and do a really beautiful painting of it. So you're kind of pushing those things as far apart as possible. A really, really ugly weed and a really beautiful painting. So that's what I want to focus on today, really trying to push the boundaries and push that tension as far apart as possible. So I think um, the ugly weed is the starting point and the beautiful painting is the end point. So um, that's where both of the exercises are going to start. Um, and I want us to think about um, energy in this process, because a lot of paintings of flowers and natural, um, uh, natural kind of botanical illustration, for me, is quite dead. It's very, very precise, very, very intricate. And I want to shake that up a bit and do something a little bit different. Um, so the first thing that I want to show you is what? I think the first thing probably is, um, I'll show you, um, I'll show you the video that I made. So this is the first thing that I started doing, which is this. So I'm, I've got two sheets of paper here. I've got an A2 piece of paper and an A3 piece of paper, and I'm just putting some paint down on those two sheets. It's um, gouache, uh, poster paint, watercolour. I'm not thinking too much about this at all. There's some green, there's some blue, there's some brown. And um, in those white pots, there's just some emulsion paint. So there's no agenda here at all, um, apart from doing some really dynamic mark making. And uh, there's a decorator's brush there. I'm not painting anything specifically. I'm just trying to get some color down. So you can see the color is mixing together and I'm doing probably 20, 25 paint strokes in total. And that's how it ends up. Once I start to add the white paint here, something not very good happens. What I wanted to do was lighten it, but I'm realizing as I'm doing it, the more paint that I, the more paint strokes that I do, the more muddy it's getting. And I don't really like that. And I, there's kind of no way out of that. You just have to stop. So that's when I moved on to the smaller canvas, uh, sorry, the smaller piece of paper. And you can see I'm doing fewer strokes. Uh, the paint's mixing a lot easier um, and uh, adding some water will give a different uh, wash. Um, so the paint will be slightly um, less opaque and a bit more, uh, a bit more transparent. And then here, what I'm doing um, with that transparent paint, I'm just covering around the edges um, just because I need a little bit more coverage because of what I'm going to do next. So I did these two and I thought, okay, they're all right. I hadn't done any before this. Uh, this is the first one I did. That it wasn't a practice one uh, before that. Um, but I thought it was kind of okay. It turned out sort of how I wanted to, but I still thought um, whilst there were some nice marks in there, um, I wanted um, a little bit more. So I got a smaller page, um, which is A4. I got some more paint out, um, but I was keeping with the decorator's brush. And um, this is a little bit more close up, so you'll see what happens here. So I used a different type of mark here. So a round swirly mark, pushing a lot harder. I'm not linear marks like on the first two pieces of paper. And I was much happier with the result. I really, really like how the colors started to mix. And um, this was seconds on the canvas, right? Maybe um, five or six seconds in total. And um, that was the result. So I can next show you this. So the inspiration for this um, way of working um, comes from two artists, which I want to show you. 
Um, the first one is um, this painting, uh, Landscape by Ivan Hitchens. And um, I remember seeing this painting as a young kid and I've always been fascinated by how sparing he is with the marks. So this is quite similar to the last landscape where it was just a very few um, marks. And this is quite abstract, but what I really, really love about this is how the colors are mixing on the canvas um, and the energy and the personality with which he's applied the paint. So we know it's some kind of landscape, but it's not really, really specific. I think we can make out some horizontal um, surface like a, a meadow or a field, and we can make out a tree and maybe some leaves and some sky, but it's not, it's not super um, realistic. Uh, but it represents landscape. And then the next one I wanted us to look at um, was this one, which is one of my favorite paintings. I've got a poster of this, um, which is Howard Hodgkin's poster for the 2012 Olympic Games for the swimming. And um, I think it caused quite a lot of con controversy because it doesn't really depict anything. It just depicts wateriness. But what I see here is a real love of mark and gesture and color. And people were kind of saying, yeah, but look, there's a little figure in there. And really that really, for me, it doesn't matter at all because the energy from the artist who was already in his 80s when he painted this um, is just really fantastic. And um, I love the color, I love the gesture, I love the movement of the paint on that canvas. And my guess is that Howard Hodgkin made many of these, maybe several hundred, and obviously they're not taking very long to do, right? Um, maybe it took a long time to think about, but the execution is not very long. So um, he probably produced tens or hundreds of these before he picked one which uh, he felt was just right. So they, those two artists were definitely the inspiration. Um, and you can see here, um, that's the first, um, that's the, sorry, that's the third uh, sheet that I did. And then that was the, the other sheet that I did there. And then that was the first one. So you can see here the, the colors are starting to kind of go a bit muddy and, and wishy-washy. So I really, really needed to stop um, when I got to that point. Um, but what I think there is here, and especially on that third one, um, you can see from those two artists that I showed you, there's, there's some real energy and movement happening here, um, which I'm going to put to good use with both of the exercises that I did after that. Um, in painting, we call that dynamism. So the, there's a lot of dynamism in the gesture. So I used the, um, the first sheet that I did. And what I did here was I started to cut out some of the shapes that I was looking at. So I found the, that was the inspiration. So that's the little weed that I used for the, um, for the inspiration for the painting. So what I was doing here, I was looking very carefully at these leaf shapes. I was looking for shapes. So remember, shapes are two-dimensional, they're flat, um, but shapes can, when they go together, we can, we can also um, make them represent form. So I was looking at the different shapes that these leaves were taking, and I was thinking, okay, I'm gonna cut out about 10 pieces. So what I did was I cut out, there's probably more than 10, but um, about that many pieces. So I was looking very carefully. I was looking at the direction of the um, paint on the paper. So here uh, is a different direction, obviously, to here. And I was really, really selecting areas of that, that piece of paper that I thought had interesting brush marks and interesting color. Um, so at this point, I want to just stop because I want to talk about how I went about doing that. So. I cut those out and I didn't do it in pencil, first of all, I just used the knife um, and the scissors to cut the shapes out. So I think that's very, very important because if you start to use a pencil first, you get a little bit obsessed and go back into some sort of drawing um, accuracy um, uh, way of working. And I think it's much more interesting just to trust the process and trust cutting it out. So the first thing that I did was, things falling on the floor, was this is important. Okay, so this is a cutting mat. This is my cutting mat, which um, I've had for a long time. It's got a bit bumpy now, um, but a really, really good investment. They've got much, much cheaper in price. And actually, you can get them even this big. So that's a small cutting mat. Um, and it's kind of some layers of rubber. And it's so that when you cut through it, um, not only does it not damage your table surface, 
um, it doesn't blunt the knife because what can happen is if you cut on newspaper or on a board you'll find that the uh, knife will blunt very quickly and this is a something a substance which is the builder's self-healing so when you cut through it um, it uh, still re re retains a really nice surface so you don't get loads of score marks in it and uh, it's made up of several layers of rubber, which is how it keeps that surface. So I think that's a really good investment. They're probably about five pounds for an A4 um, cutting mat, and then you can buy them online. Um, the brand is J A K A R Jacquard. Um, I know they make knives as well, um, but you can order one of those. Really, really good investment. They last a long time. And I think that fell on the floor. Right. So something else that's really good investment. If you've got a cutting mat, it's good to have a steel ruler. Okay, so a steel ruler is really, I didn't use a ruler for this, but a ruler is really good idea, steel ruler, because when you're using a knife to cut against, um, the knife won't score into the ruler. So if you have a plastic ruler, what will happen is you will end up um, cutting into the ruler. So uh, a metal ruler, stainless steel ruler, uh, this one's 30 centimeters. Um, I recommend it um, three pounds maybe. Um, and I probably had this since I was at college, so a long time. Right, and then the next thing is these two things. So the difference here is this is a craft knife, a box cutter, and this is a scalpel. Now, it, I want to talk about this because there's a big difference between these two things. Box cutter is fine, but um, this is one of those where you have a, um, a retractable knife and you can snap it off in the end part there. And this is good, but I wouldn't be using this for um, this task. Um, it's not um, accurate enough and it doesn't go around corners and curves quite so easily. I probably wouldn't use a Stanley knife because it's a bit too heavy duty. So what I want to talk about is this. So this is a scalpel and it's the same kind of scalpel that surgeons use. It's just that the blade here is not a uh, surgical blade. So it's not sterilized, but these are really, really excellent and um, you just replace the blade. You've got to be incredibly careful because it is the same instrument that surgeons use. But this is the only one that I recommend. There are other ones that I've seen which are more pen-like. So they've got a cylindrical shaft here and then um, the blade fits into a cross. And I just don't like those at all. The blade moves all over the place. Um, these are really good. The blades are really cheap um, and you can just replace them. And they're just, they're just excellent. And when when you use them you'll see from here um, that you can be really really accurate about um, the, uh, the the cuts that you make from very very small slivers here to these these parts here so that's really what i recommend i recommend you getting a scalpel and getting some scalpel blades the blades i recommend are 10a so they're not too skinny they're not going to snap um uh too easily and um they're not something a uh, little bit you can get lots of different types um, but 10a is the basic type and i think that's a, a really really good one for um doing something like cutting out paper um that craft knife that i showed you is really good for doing something like um sh uh, pencil sharpening so what i did was here i started to look at my weed that I've got from the garden and started to assemble the um, the collage basically. So here I'm making a collage but I think the difference here is that there's two parts to this. The collage part was very very intricate but the brush making part was very kind of quick and gestural and had a lot of energy. So like I talked about at the beginning I'm trying to push those two things far away. So I'm, I'm trying to make as much tension as possible between the quick gestural uh, impulsive colour application from the brush and then also the kind of finickety, uh, delicate, painstaking bit of uh, looking and uh, trying to recreate um, the, uh, the composition from that little weed that I showed you at the beginning. Um, and then so I did this and I stuck it down um, with some really teeny bits of tape um, and then I thought I didn't really like the composition so I the tape allowed me to take off the, uh, the leaf at the bottom. And I thought that was just a bit better. I don't know if it's a bit more kind of patterny and illustrative. Um, it's not as accurate. Um, the, uh, the first one is more accurate. So um, what I wanted to say here, the tape allowed me to shuffle things around a bit to try and get stuff uh, working right. 
Um, and in terms of glue, um, Pritt stick is okay for sticking paper to paper. PVA glue, the white stuff, woodworking glue is no good because it will, it's got too much moisture in it. Um, photo mounts, really good, but really expensive. Um, why photo mounts really good is because the paper and the paint uh, on the paper, we know reacts to water. Um, so uh, something like spray mount doesn't have water in it, it has spirit in it, which will just help you make your collage um, a little bit better. But those are the two things I want to show you there with the manual method of doing this, which is very um, uh, um, trying to get that contrast between um, the energy from the brush strokes and the color from the brush strokes into looking at this really, really tiny um, weed. Okay, so that was the first one. Now, I want to show you something. Um, how have I got? I've got nine minutes, so I've got to work pretty quickly. Uh, yes, it's a modifiable collage, exactly. But I guess um, I guess most collages are modifiable, right? Because you make them and then you, or you cut out the bits and then you lay them down. So um, I think it's more keeping stuff fluid and able to modify is a really, really good technique whether you're doing a painting um, or whether you're doing a collage. This is kind of halfway between a painting and a collage. Um, part of me thinks collages can be a bit boring. So this is a way to sort of, yeah, mix those two things up. Right, I wanna show you this thing that I saw. So this is gonna involve a foam and it's gonna involve some water. So hopefully water and technology are not great, but what I'm gonna do, this has got a camera here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a droplet of water onto the camera and then you'll see what happens. So this was sort of important for what I was doing with um, with my teeny tiny little weeds. So let's start with that. You can maybe, okay, so if I get the camera working right. Hopefully that will work, okay. Let me just check it's okay. Yes, okay, so hello, there's me, you can see it's on the ceiling. Right, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, you'll see what happens when there's me there, and I'm gonna put a little drop of water on the lens. Okay, and I've gone out of focus, you can see that. But then what happens is if I get some plants, which are much smaller, I can bring those into into focus and I can take some really amazing footage of these little tiny weeds that I found out found when I was going for a walk. Look at the detail on that, it's amazing. That second one that I did was a um, this one was one of those sticky sticky plants that you can throw and you can see on that it's got all those um, those little fibers that stick to you when, uh, when you throw them. So if we go back through those, you can see that's a way to really investigate some very, very close up, um, very, very small bits of greenery. So it doesn't really, you don't have to find this massive triffid that's growing somewhere. You can just find a really, really small uh, bit of greenery. And I think when you zoom in and look at it from this level, uh, it starts to take on a whole new life. So that's the inspiration that I used. So um, when I did it, I'm just going to, you get the idea there. And um, when I did it, I, um, I, I used this plant. Let me just plug that in. So that was the plant that I used. And I just, I took that one there. Okay, so I just, that's the one that I was looking at when I was drawing. I'll keep that there. So the last method is a digital method. Um, and if I share with you uh, the second way of looking at this. So it's kind of the same way, but it's just that uh, the first way of doing the collage was a manual collage. And this one is a digital collage. So I'm using Procreate on an iPad, but you could use um, any tool really where you can um, manipulate image. So you could also do this in Photoshop. Um, and 
the way that I'm working here is I'm looking at the plant here. Um, I don't know if you can, if you do, maybe, hang on, let me put it up, up a little bit higher, you might be able to see it. <laughs> you can just see it there. Um, I'm looking here at the plant um, and I'm looking for shapes um, within the painting that I have here. And all I'm doing is, let me just check I'm in the right layer, no I'm not. Um, I'm looking for shapes and I'm thinking, okay, well, the shape that that makes, if you can look at the screen, you'll see what I mean. I'm looking for one shape and then copying it. So what I have here, I've built up a library of shapes. So I did some earlier just to make it a little bit easier for you guys to see. So um, in here, let's put it around that way, it might be easier for me to work. Um, in here, there's a, a library of shapes that have come from, um, there's about 10 of them from looking at this. And then I think what I would start to do is looking at the, um, the selection that I have here is just start to make a digital collage. So I can resize stuff. So I can make stuff bigger or smaller and I can start to move stuff around. So real quickly, I'm just going to try and go ahead and show you what I mean just by trying to move things, oops, move things around. So I know that when I talk, um, I can, I can do stuff a bit quicker. And you can, you know, you can do stuff like you can flip stuff when it's digital. Um, I'm not a massive fan of um, necessarily of doing stuff like this. I just thought I wanted to experiment for my own for my own um, interest really to find out how it would be moving stuff around and um, seeing if I could make something work um, just in a different way. I mean, I, th I think the selection process is probably really similar, right? So I think finding stuff, um, making stuff work um, as a whole is gonna be the same whether you do it um, manually um, or whether you do it um, in a digital way like this. So let me just see if I can finish this. I think also with this kind of collage, what, what I tended to find is that um, when I did the manual collage and also when I did this, I had to move the layers around a little bit because um, some of them were not really, uh, were not really in the right position um, all the time. So I was lifting some bits up and uh, sticking some bits underneath just to try and make that work better. Like that one, for example, I want that to go behind the other shape. So it's important that I move that down and then it goes there. What have I got now? I don't think I need those other shapes. I think I can, I think I can get rid of them. So I'm going to get rid of that one. I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to get rid of that shape there. Okay. So I've ended up with that, which I kind of quite like as a base. And then when I really look in here, I've got some very, very small um, cornflower blue. So I could add those in. So don't be scared about adding something on top. And here as well, I did, I made the background. I didn't want a white background. So I made a background color, um, which was uh, off white a little bit because I just I thought that kind of pushed the, the green forward somewhat. So that's what I've ended up with there. And when you zoom right in, you can see all those lovely color 
um, gestures are still there. And I thought that was really kind of an interesting way to, to work with both of those. So there's a bit of composition. I'd probably move that around a bit, but um, there, I think that's not starting to be a kind of interesting um, way of looking at this kind of horrible um, weed in a beautiful way. So that's really the end of today's session. So looking at something that's ugly, trying to transform it through your art, through your creativity to make it something beautiful. And I think that's a really important um, message from me as an artist is always to look into those corners that nobody else is looking. So like I said, everybody loves flowers, but I don't love flowers. I hate flowers. And for me, um, they're over decorative and um, they're already kind of beautiful. So it's just kind of like, yeah, over romantic and schmaltzy. So I want to look at things and try and make art from things that is not necessarily conventional, um, conventional, beautiful things to begin with. Um, and that's the process uh, which we call alternative thinking and also trying to look at the world in new ways, which is a very important message um, and we can all do. So um, hopefully you've enjoyed that tutorial today and um, I'll plan the next one for Friday. So thank you very much for watching and um, I'll see you next time.